and welcome everybody to the Red Leaf Retrocast Patreon show over LLPW. We are beginning this journey on the $5 tier. Thank you everybody for this first and free episode. This is kind of a, uh, a good little journey to start. I'm your host, JD. We will be learning and enjoying everything that uh, Ladies Legends Pro Wrestling has to offer. This is super fun. This promotion has been... It's very fascinating to me with uh, the split of JWP. A good chunk of their wrestlers just splitting rosters. What Shinobu Kandori uh, wanted to bring uh, to a unique environment of the Joshi Wrestling world over in Japan. And we are starting with an event uh, that you probably have never heard of. And it's it functions as the ambitious start of what LLPW uh, was originally supposed to be, or at least the idea was. So the goals of this journey are to learn the wrestlers, learn the history, watch some awesome, awesome women's wrestling, and go from there. Uh, we, we're going to be uh, coming out with episodes at least once a month. Uh, at the end of each month, uh, near nearing the end, uh, to go along with my Starcade reviews, everything on the $5 tier. So wherever you're listening to this, whether it's on the uh, YouTube channel, Red Leaf Retrocast, uh, Red Leaf Retrocast proper, uh, over on K's Big Egg Joshi podcast, or the All Japan Women's Destiny, uh, if you enjoy this episode and want to continue along with the journey of us watching and learning, uh, join the Patreon. You'll have access to the drive in which a lot of these shows that I'm buying uh, will be found, and we could all watch and learn together over over this unique and kind of cult classic wrestling promotion that is LLPW. This episode title is The Association. The name of the event that we're covering first is the LPWA Super Ladies Showdown. It took place on February 23rd, 1992 from Rochester, Minnesota in the Civic Center over uh it's a it's a small town just outside Minneapolis and the attendance was 400 people. We have a commentary team of Joe Penazito and one Jim Cornette. Yes, this pay-per-view in early 1992, an all-women show featuring half-American, or I should say, half-Western women's wrestlers and Japanese, the crew, uh, about eight wrestlers in total from what will be known as LLPW, Jim Cornette is on commentary for this show. We also have a guy by the name of uh, uh, Mick Karsh. He's doing backstage interviews in a hallway with horrible echo. Uh, it almost looks like a school hallway right before you go into a gym. We have Bonnie Blackstone. Uh, she is an attractive southern blonde woman. She's doing backstage interviews in what they call the hospitality suite. And it is here where we get Jim Cornette's uh, first moments to get canceled <laughs> here early on the show uh let's let's give a nice little listen to the ridiculousness of one jim Cornette throughout the show it will be a recurring theme here we go all right mick karsh will be standing by there in the tunnel where he will be interviewing some of the participants of today's card as they are just about to come out to the ring we will be getting their thoughts just as they're coming to the ring bonnie blackstone is standing by she is in the hospitality suite where she will be giving us <laughs> i can imagine how hospitable she's being back there in the hospitality suite knowing bonnie all right she is going to be interviewing up close and personal some of the wrestlers on today's card bonnie all right, and that's only just one example of what uh, you can expect from Jim Cornette on an all-women's pay-per-view show. Now, I'm going to continue introducing kind of what we're, what we're watching here uh, from a, a casting standpoint and the wrestlers. And then I got some nice little information over uh, what this show actually was and what the goal was uh, before we get into our matches. So 
yes, uh, Jim Cornette implying that Bonnie Blackstone is uh, seducing and having sex with people uh, back in the hospitality suite. Uh, one of many cancellations what we'll have with one Jim Cornette. Finally, before the matches, we get uh, the famous Nick Bockwinkle and Sue Hennig, the uh, I believe the sister of Kurt Hennig, uh, Mr. Perfect. Uh, and what they do here is they predict each match uh, before they happen, and they run through the experience of the wrestlers, their size, both height and weight, uh, and and run a prediction based on just those stat lines. And it's a very pure wrestling itself perspective and <laughs> when they cut to them they stumble immediately out of the gate no one knows who to start they just keep beckoning towards each other oh no you start oh no it's okay i, I really laughed at this blunder uh, but for the rest of the show after this point they they, they find their groove and uh, go from there and yes we have a commissioner for this thing of lpwa uh, this turtle looking guy here his name's wally carbo uh, he brings us in clearly horrible uh, reading of a cue card. His eyes are darting back and forth. He's stumbling all over his words. It's uh, it's quite a mess. This squirrely looking guy. Uh, that won't be the last time we see of one Wally Carbo. Then we have Al Darouche as our ring announcer. His job on the show is to mess up everybody's name tonight, and he starts strong. Uh, let's listen in <laughs> to what Al Darouche has to say as he begins the show. We want to welcome everyone to this worldwide pay-for-view event here on the LPWA, the Ladies Professional Wrestling Association, for today's Super Ladies Showdown. A fantastic afternoon of top professional wrestling action. The LPWA brings together the top lady wrestlers from throughout the world. Stay with it's going to be just fantastic. Oh, yes. Pay for view. That's that's what uh, old Al Darouche here brings us in. Uh, and he also messes up, as I mentioned before, just about every single name <laughs> on, on the show. It's quite it's quite spectacular. Uh, the job this guy does. And one thing I noticed was this is early 92. And. The verbiage and presentation of all of this is still very 1970s, early 80s with with how they how they talk, how they present. All these women wrestlers are ladies throughout the show. It's kind of it's still got the cadence of of this old style presentation of a game show, if you will. It's it's uh, it really doesn't come across as. And you kind of see this on my Starcade journeys uh, with all of the Starcades, uh, but Tony Schiavone does kind of bring some freshness and and a, a younger perspective to it of the time. But this is still very much uh, old era past, basically. That's how it's uh, presented and comes across. Uh, where was I? Oh, yes. They make sure to introduce the Parade of Wrestlers. <laughs> really emphasize on Parade. Jim Cornette makes his just terrible jokes. Uh, it's just a visual ed entrance of everyone just coming to the ring. Uh, who's going to be on the show tonight? And first and foremost, front and center are Reggie Bennett and Terry Powers, a.k.a. Tori later in WWF uh, from that run and in her kind of short stint in DX. Uh, you're, you're kind of two big babyface wrestlers on the show. And Reggie Bennett, for those that don't know, she does uh, start wrestling in Japan. I believe it's JWP uh, throughout 1991. And uh, she debuted in kind of 1990 in the Western kind of California territory. And if you look up pictures of Reggie Bennett in her rookie year, she is maybe 130 pounds. And there's a lot of kind of articles over her in kind of old observers uh, through Dave Meltzer. She is pushing maybe 190 at this point in time. She doesn't even remotely look like the same person. Uh, I don't know if she just uh, wanted to bulk up or she gained a lot of weight. She doesn't come across as fat by any means. It definitely is a lot of muscle. And uh, it, it, the point is not remotely looking like the same person. It's, uh, it's quite the side-by-side uh, -side comparison of one Reggie Bennett. Uh, she is she is quite the character throughout the show. 
So after this long intro with national anthems and the like, we get back to our commentary team and uh, Cornette goes full Joker mode from here, uh, burying people of the Minnesota. He's calling them fat thieves. You get the idea. Uh, and now thus starts his commentary over women and uh, the short version to describe uh, who all of all these women are, if not most. Uh, the Western women on this card are basically the former 1980s WWF stars in the women's division when they tried there. Uh, some women from the show Glow, which is very, very famous in history, and uh, also all have experience in the former AWA. So that kind of uh, makes sense of l at least working with Nick Bockwinkle, hence all the names they got. And of course, what brings us here to a good chunk, good chunk of the roster of, of from Japan is what we will know as LLPW later into 1992. Now, information... You can actually follow a lot of this coverage in various uh, Japanese magazines covering the split of, a, uh, of JWP in 1991, heading into 92, and The Observer covered uh, quite a lot of the split in JWP. So the biggest news here, let's break down how this show came to be, is first of all, it's incredible the show actually happened with what a mess and carny show uh, this was uh, all to be built. So there is this guy in the, uh, let's call it the AWA territory, you know, the Min the Minnesota Nick Bockwinkle thing. It's the former, the AWA is closed. The WWF has relaunched a second try at a women's division, and WCW had a deal with JWP, and they were kind of bringing, uh, bringing in the women to wrestle on kind of WCW Saturday night, and later we'll know as Nitro. So women's wrestling is kind of going through another trial period after the shutdown of the 80s and the WWF. Uh, the AWA has now closed, as I mentioned, and they had a lot of women that were coming into their territory. Uh, let's call that the Mer Mildred Burke uh, his historical sense. OK, well, there's this guy in Minnesota. His name <laughs> is Tor Berg. All right. And one Mr. Berg. Uh, comes across as a straight-up territory carny guy. His idea, with now the closure of JWP, was to start a women's promotion in this de now defunct territory and make his own women's territory. Glow was not uh, uh, was not funded for uh, another season, so a lot of the women needed work, and they weren't hired. Uh, they weren't part of this new hiring process or new direction WWF's women's direction was going. And since WCW were bringing in JWP with the split, uh, the people that split off, uh, let's call them the Kandori group, needed work. And Kandori didn't have the funding to immediately start her promotion. Okay? In comes Mr. Berg wanting to revamp this territory in his own image. So Bachwinkle wanted work. He got in Jim Cornette. He got Blackstone. He got all these famous uh, Southern uh, kind of Smoky Mountain type people, along with uh, various women's wrestlers that also needed work uh, that weren't getting hired by the WWF. So it all it all kind of just happenstance comes together. The problem was uh, the LPWA wanted to run television tapings and all this, and they were they weren't even remotely successful, and they wanted to make a whole season out of this show in kind of a revamp form. And it was about ten months in between this show and their last show. So it's a mess financially. Uh, what ends up happening was all because this was just so put together so fast and almost on no notice, uh, they didn't sell any tickets to the show. All 400 people you saw in this in this venue were all let in free, so they didn't make a dime on it. Also, this is run on pay-per-view in 1992. Needless to say, not a lot of people bought this show. It was reported as being one of the lowest pay-per-view buy rates of all time, and they couldn't even get the numbers. It, it, it was uh, quite fascinating uh, to read all of this happening. You can actually look in the, into, into the... Uh, uh, 1992 Observer newsletter over uh, what all this entailed, and uh, I'm kind of summarizing this. So there was also reported to be 
on television, uh, as commentary is telling us, an ice storm. A big, there's just snow over the last couple of days. Ice has just en- 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 engrossed everybody. Uh, and really, that was just an excuse to why so little fans showed up, the little uh, preparation that was involved, and why so few uh, few re- women's wrestlers were able to make the show. Uh, so this was their excuse for the end result being uh, being below par, let's call it. Uh, uh, funny enough, this this show was actually kind of fun, and uh, it really got across kind of the idea of what they wanted to do. And just you know, many decades before uh, the the women's revolution and WWE TNA's, uh, it took years and years for them to launch their idea of what women's wrestling was going to be. Uh, th- this was kind of a landmark show, and could have been so much more. So Berg and Kandori uh, uh, supposedly came to an agreement that the LPWA was going to be a launching point for what LLPW was going to be in Japan. And it was going to be one promotion of of, uh, Western wrestling here in America. And then the other half of the promotion was going to be in Japan. And we'll just, for the sake of it, call it LLPW. So you had Berg's home promotion in America and Kandori's promotion in Japan. So part one of this was going to be what the show we're going to review here today and go over. And part two, uh, about four to six months later, was going to be the second part of LPWA in Kandori's promotion. So they were going to be there. It's it's kind of an association uh, of what kind of the three WA was originally uh, uh, originally was with with. um, AJW and company, and then there was eventually a split from there. Uh, so the idea here is super interesting. There's going to be all these famous Western American wrestlers, and then you have the you have Japan, and uh, they would run their home promotions, and then once or twice a year they would have a big super show, and that's what we have here, and hence why the name is called Super Lady Showdown. They would have an American title, the LPWA title, and the uh. Uh, Asian title, as they as they called it, the Japanese women's title uh, for each promotion. They would have their main title, and then there would be one tag title, uh, which would be the LPWA tag titles held by the Glamour Girls. And they would the tag titles would function as a a traveling title. They would they would go back and forth between the promotions, and that way you would have challengers of the like, interesting matchups. Everything's always fresh, and you wouldn't have a stagnant program with that. Uh, and it, you would have more wrestlers traveling back, back and forth uh, of sharing of talent and really rounding out the rosters. Because on the surface, you only have about 12 to 14 women on each side. So you would need this crossover to fill out the rosters and keep these cards fresh. So again, the idea on the surface is very interesting and could work in theory if this Tor Bear guy knew what he was doing. <laughs> It was it was such a mess. So when you put it all together, you put all these puzzle pieces together correctly. Berg, little notice, couldn't get all the wrestlers he wanted, spent all this money for a pay per view. All the fans were let in free. You have all this talent in Cornette and Company and and Bachwinkle that are brought in not cheaply. You you flew in eight Japanese women all the way from Tokyo <laughs> to come to the show. And basically everyone, uh, the, the the reports are that Berg had to fund most of this out of his own pocket. And everyone pretty much, uh, basically Cornette got paid, uh, 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 Bachwinkle got paid, uh, uh, our, our, basically everyone from the West got paid, Kandori got paid, and the rest of the rosters of all the women's wrestlers uh, they got paid for their flights, but no one got their flights home. So that left a lot of these people stranded in Minnesota where they had to pay out of their own pockets, which led to a lot of these women hitting the Indies in St. Louis and whatnot. If you follow it, uh, I believe it was um, uh, women of wrestling uh, to basically get paid enough so they can fly home from there so it was a big kind of joint effort in trying to get a lot of these women paid and that had them traveling around the country for about a month uh, before they were able to finally get home Uh, what a a fucking mess this was 
Also, the original idea of people that they wanted to bring in were Rent Wendy Richter, uh, Devil Masami, and Dynamite Kansai. They were all originally scheduled, but Richter, they couldn't find her in time to get her on the show. Magnificent Mimi, uh, they straight up denied her coming for whatever reason. I uh, couldn't find the exact reason why. They just straight up didn't want her there. Uh, probably has some has, has some backstage uh, 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 grudges, we'll call it. But uh, Masami and Kansai were uh, originally scheduled, but because of the JWP split and they weren't on Team Kandori, they did not uh, come to the show. Uh, so simple enough there. Uh, a mess at the end of the day. Um, but all the wrestlers still enjoyed themselves nonetheless. Uh, and it turned out to be a pretty good show. Uh, Harley Saito came into this show uh, with an injured knee. Uh, so she wrestled hurt for most of the show. And let's get into what the show was exactly how 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 did it was it entertaining i i've already kind of hinted that it was a good show a lot of uh, a lot of heel heat a lot of unknowns um, unknown factors coming in so again if you like what you've heard so far and you've already learned a lot like i have coming in and a lot of the research hit me up on twitter at bowling jd uh you can listen more episodes to this monthly at uh, the Red Leaf Retrocast Patreon, easily searchable. Red Leaf Retrocast, red single word, leaf single word, retrocast, a full word there, three separate words. Uh, this will all be on the $5 tier to go along with the Starcade reviews, K's JD Star reviews from Big Egg Joshi Podcast, and you will also have access two weeks early to our journey through the Joshi 2010s, coming out of the Dark Age, a big, long journey uh, throughout the decade of of a lot of these promotions and and wrestlers rising out and falling uh, accordingly. So we have uh, a big archive already uh, set uh, six months into into all this, and we're it's a lot of fun. So definitely consider supporting. And let's get on with this card. All right, opening match. As I take a sip of my coffee with Bailey's, because this is very fun. We have Mami Kitamura and Miki Honda taking on a defeating Allison Royal and Lisa Starr. Match went three minutes, 46 seconds. It's the first match in. It takes no time at all for Jim Cornette to get canceled yet again. <laughs> Here we go. That is the wrong one. Here we go. Up several times in the LPWA, and I understand they've been working out together. However, let's be honest, this team of Kitamori and Honda from Japan are a very experienced team. Well, I'll tell you something, Joe. You got to uh, you got to admire the fact that Allison Royal seems to have been working out quite a bit. She is looking more voluptuous than we have seen her in the past, but Lisa Starr, always a favorite of mine, and she is taking it to Mickey Honda right now. Yes, okay, Jim Cornette commenting on the women's breast size uh, for her skills, uh, this, this fucking guy. This is when commentary begins, us, uh, begins to inform us, the viewer, the low audience, is due to the heavy amount of ice and snow, which uh, was absolutely not true. <laughs> there was clear skies and weather throughout uh, Minneapolis uh, during this time, as well as the excuse why some Big women names weren't there to make the show. So this is when they start. Uh, yeah, they have all their excuses. Uh, simple, quick, fast display from Kitamura and Honda. Win in short fashion. A top rope power slam looked really cool. And this kind of set the pace for the rest of the show where the Japanese women would have uh, their fast go, go, go style. Uh, the Western women's wrestlers would would keep up quite well. Despite all, they are they are all, you know, uh, they're all hitting the indies. They're all still wrestling. And they're in good shape, so this was very fun and simple. Uh, none of these matches are going to blow you away. It's it's still kind of short and simple at the end of the day, and that's that is okay uh, with what we got here. Our second match uh, is part of our tournament that we're doing tonight. As commentary brings us in, they introduced us at the beginning of the show. There is a tournament for the vacant Japanese women's title for the for this uh, association that they're doing. While the LPWA is going to be, uh, the, the Western title is going to be defended in the main event, along with a tag title and a couple special singles matches uh, throughout the night uh, as this 
Japanese title tournament is going on. And yes, you do have a, a Western women competing for this thing in the tournament as well. So again, the idea of the show is really interesting and good. You don't have like if you have the Japanese title, it's not exclusive to Japan. So you can kind of in, in, infer that the champions themselves would also be traveling just to add to the cards. Uh, <laughs> it's 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 a really cool idea of what what we're uh, getting here. If uh, management had any idea, remote idea of how to uh, try to make this profitable and sustainable, which obviously uh, had zero shot. Our next match is part of this tournament. It is Denise Storm, a local woman, uh, taking on and defeating Susan Green. Six minutes, two seconds this went. This night was all about trying to make Denise Storm the big deal. Because she is a local woman from Minneapolis. So she is going to be your local star, heel or face or what have you. In this case, they they wanted to make her a big heel uh, because there was a lot of babyface women's wrestlers already on the roster. Uh, Reggie Bennett being kind of the main one. Uh, crowd really liked her. And I understand the idea here. Uh, Susan Green is a grizzled veteran from the Texas Territory, uh, trained by kind of the Von Erics of, of that area. And asked to basically build and get this local heel and newbie, Denise Storm, over. Uh, Green did quite a bit of... Uh, she did quite adic- adequate in this job. But my God, Storm is just pretty awful. <laughs> match all builds to storm fumbling to get a chain out of the tongue of her boot. Uh, she fights and fights and fights, but the laces, I guess were too tight. Uh, she's trying to loosen them up. It's, it's just a disaster. She can't grab the chain out from it. It's really funny. It's so awkward. Finally, as she fumbles more outside of the ring, she gets the chain here. And, uh, I must pause and break down something really quick because it's here where we hear Joe Penazito inform us that Rush Limbaugh, the nationally famous conservative political radio guy, is a big fan of the LPWA, and his favorite wrestler is Susan Green. Uh, I have my doubts about this uh, this, uh, declaration from Joe Penazito on commentary, but it's fucking hilarious and outrageous, the things uh, that are said throughout the show when it's not Jim Cornette trying to get canceled uh, at every waking moment. Now, here we finally get to our finish, and it's one of the few dumb, shitty things we'll see on the show. Green is putting the boots to Green. Uh, uh, yeah, Susan Green's putting the boots to Storm in the corner. And finally, the ref rips and throws Green across the ring. I'm like, oh, my God, you're you, dude, because <laughs> this dude is kind of tall. He's he's in great shape. So he just rips the woman out of the corner, throws to the ground. He gets in her face and they're fighting. Uh, so Storm finally gets the chain from her boot. Green shoves the ring aside. He gets knocked down. And as he's turned around and getting up, uh, uh, Susan Green gets knocked out cold by Storm via the chain punch. And there's this awkward pause. Storm looks at the ref, throws the chain out of the ring right in front of the referee. He watches her, throws it away, and then she pins her. Uh, It's awful and really funny. It's just, ah, don't worry about it. But it did get a lot of booze from the crowd. And that's the other thing on this show. The crowd was into all this. They were into all the heels. They were into all the faces. We knew exactly everyone's role. It was very, very well executed in that sense uh, for a Western audience. Uh, it's, it's quite. It was quite surprising. Uh, our next, our next uh, tournament match is Reggie Bennett. She's taking on and defeats Yukari Osawa. Six minutes, 19 seconds. Osawa's kind of got the spider-type paint on her face. It's a nice little look. And uh, I'm not going to go over every one of these backstage interviews that they end up doing. They're all kind of kind of the same, and they say the same, or they, they, they want to win the match. They're in good shape. Uh, they respect their opponent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Bonnie Blackstone in the hospitality suite, she, she goes through the same thing. She asks basic questions. Uh, the wrestlers, or uh, in, in one case later, there's a trainer. They answer very plainly. And then we cut to Hennig and Bachwinkle uh, at their little screen, and they're uh, predicting, as I mentioned earlier. It's a fine little formula throughout the night, but nothing standout-ish. Uh, occasionally, we get the hallway interview, which also leads to kind of hard cuts, you know, short, nothing important really said. So Reggie Bennett here, her gear is a yellow construction worker, <laughs> complete with suspenders and hard hat. It is a ridiculous look, to say the least. And unfortunately, throughout her night, uh, she has a 
let's not beat around the bush here. She has massive boobs, and there's no sports bra, and unfortunately, they fight to escape her very loose shirt throughout her night. It's the fight of the century. <laughs> uh, so introductions are through, and we get the next cancel Cornette moment. And, uh, okay, last audio cue from Cornette on the night, because uh, he's full of all these kind of one-liner cancellations, uh, including uh, lesbian sex references and some very problematic Asian slurs, among others. Uh, yeah, Cornette is a... He's a theme throughout the show, so let's get into what he says about Reggie Bennett here, which is very, very insulting. All right. Hey, Joe, I'll tell you what. I understand that Reggie Bennett's fame has been spreading far and wide. And believe me, from looking at her, that's not all that's been spreading. 189 pounds. you got to be kidding me. She's right. bulked up for this tournament. I guess she figures she spent all that time in Japan. She scouted these Japanese opponents. If she can't out them, she'll out Yes, indeed. He, uh, I don't think it, it needs to be said, but yeah, he implies she uh, spreads her legs and she's fat. Uh, he, he claims bulked up, but he, throughout the night, he just, he, he basically calls her fat and it's quite ridiculous. Uh, I won't be playing more of Cornette from, from here. Uh, you get the idea of the, of the shit that he was saying throughout the night. It's, uh, it's quite disgusting throughout. He was really the only true negative on the show uh not uh, in hindsight probably not the best idea to have him so let's see here yes uh solid simple match nice little format uh won't blow you away bennett wins with a big tilt a whirl slam audience pops for the move and that's another thing on the show with a lot of the moves that uh that the llpw women were bringing and uh reggie bennett among others uh, they were pulling out some big moves here. Top rope cross bodies, uh, this big total oral slam here. A lot of a lot of moves that you just don't even see from the men uh, from this time. And that's that's one of the big things about women's wrestling in the 80s and 90s is they were so far ahead of their time that they were pulling out more exciting matches, a lot more energy, not a lot of slow and prodding stuff. And with the with the exception of a couple shit finishes uh very 1980s western style here uh the, the wrestling was very very s solid throughout the show uh the show was kind of t you know if i'm going to put on a recommendation scale i would say nothing makes my my 1 to 3 scale it's all kind of a zero but uh and then, and then if you're going by kind of a star rating system of 5 you know everything's kind of two stars two and a half Nothing blow away, nothing that you would see kind of out of AJW or even later LLPW that we'll see. Uh, but from a Western perspective and what they wanted to accomplish, everything was done uh, pretty much how you would expect and want. Okay. Uh, we have our first special singles match on the night is Shinobu Kandori defeating and taking on Desiree Peterson. Yes. So now is a good time to bring up the pre-match intro cue cards. So it's got the wrestler stats, height, weight, etc., and even a short little phrase uh, that gives them some personality in 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 the words. Uh, Kandori uh, Kandori's kind of says uh, who she thinks her her hardest opponent's been, uh, what she think of America uh, coming th this far, etc. The problem with this was you have zero time to read any of it because it's only on the screen for maybe two seconds tops all night. So. If you're watching like I was on an old DVD, you have to pause it or rewind it and get back to that cue card to read it all. So that was a problem. So imagine watching this on imagine you paid money for this on pay-per-view in 1992. And you're just like, OK, I want to see their stat lines. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> you have no chance unless you were VHS recording it, uh, which is very possible. Now, oh, boy, the ring announcer from here has a rough night pronouncing any of the LLPW names, and even some of the American names. Uh, he introduces Kandori as Shinobi Kandori, and this cues the commentary and Bachwinkle like to now think they were wrong in saying Shinobu, so they follow up from this moment in whatever the whatever the ring announcer says these names, they mimic him. So he call, the, the ring announcer calls her Shinobi? Well, goddammit, Cornette and company, she is now Shinobi Kandori. <laughs> what a time and what a mess. Get your names right, guys. It's not hard. 
This was short and fine, as is tradition of the night. Kandori makes short work of Peterson, hits the tiger bomb, gives the audience the big fuck you with the fist bicep motion. Ha cha! <laughs> really laughed at commentary. Uh, really all the crew telling us this was part of the tournament. Kandori's going far in it, boys. This was not a tournament match. It was just a special singles match. Jesus, a mess. Just communication. Communication. Uh... Yeah, nobody, nobody, as 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 their heavy sports like presentation that they wanted to present, uh, not one of them mentioned that Kando- Kandori was a former uh, Olympic judo. <laughs> All right, continuing on the tournament, Harley Saito defeats Mizuki Endo seven minutes six seconds. Uh, this is uh, they pronounce Harley Saito as Saito. Uh, Saito wins fast and furious, good strikes and kicks. Comes off, uh, comes off the winning with a tombstone pile driver. And according to the Observer, uh, the people that reported back to one Dave Meltzer, this was their match of the night. So injured Saito pulling out match of the night with a young Iger here in Midori. Or no, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mizuki Endo, yeah, Iger. Uh, Eagle Sawai takes on and defeats Midori Saito. Uh, Sawai is how they pronounce Eagle Sawai throughout the night here. Big bad heel Eagle. Uh, she plays her role. Uh, quite well. She plays the crowd, and after she wins with her cutie special, really big pop out of the crowd with that one, Cornette like, loses his mind on this move. Uh, yeah, she wins, gives all the teenagers in the front row some lip. She gives a middle finger to the crowd, also does the whole ha uh, bicep thing. Uh, she's yelling at them. She's pointing to people in the crowd. Eagle Sawai, big bad heel. And then there's these teenagers in the aisleway slash front row. And they're all giving her the middle finger. One tall boy uh, with a with a hat just looks like straight up Minnesota teenager out of the early 90s. He pushes the railing towards Eagle Sawai and he's leaning over. Eagle rushes in. He backs up quick and she pushes that railing right back into him to the shock and smile of all these boys. They're having a great time. And the crowd had a great time. There's a lot of kids in the show. They were just really into all the Japanese women. They're all heels. <laughs> It's phenomenal stuff. Really takes the boys by surprise when Eagle uh, pounces back at them. Definitely one of my favorite little pro wrestling moments on the show. Uh, yes, Eagle won with the cutie special. We're under our second special singles match. It's a grudge match. It's Black Venus with Boogaloo Brown, kind of a little uh, famous manager if you've heard of him, taking on and defeats Rockin' Robin. Five minutes, 39 seconds. Venus here notably having a Don King-like manager, that's Boogaloo Brown, without the tall hair, of course, and she's got black power written on the black of her tights. Ooh. Former WWF champion, Rockin' Robin, in the grudge match here. This was all all about heat. Got a nice short little walk and brawl type match. Uh, Robin gets slammed in the commentary table and she gets busted open hard way, so we got some blood. It's pretty cool stuff. Crowd's loving it. And uh, it ends with Venus doing electric chair backdrop, and she pulls the tights for the cheating win. Ooh, this dastardly heel. Robin, all pissed off at the cheating pin. Uh, she throws a punch at the manager. Boogaloo Brown takes a big back bump on the outside. And Venus and, and Rockin' Robin, oh, this feud's not over. It's good heat here. Uh, needless to say, they would. Uh, I believe they continued this in the St. Louis kind of indie territory. But uh, it was supposed to be a big uh, LPWA uh, heel versus face uh, feud going forward that uh, they had to continue somewhere else. Our semifinals begin here. It is Denise Storm. Yes, our local heel extraordinaire taking on Reggie Bennett. Big face. She's gone through a little wardrobe change here to try to uh, uh, keep keep the keep the prized mentions uh, within her shirt. Not sure how else to say that. Uh, forgive me. But uh, so, yeah, this match was atrocious and slow. It's the worst one of the night. Uh, Storm is awful. She's an awful wrestler. She has zero timing. It's a mess until, yes, a rough, br- rough bump happens. Storm sidesteps and big lariat by Bennett as she crashes into the ref. Storm grabs a chair, but Bennett blocks and grabs it herself. She takes a swing and misses, and the ref sees all of this. Aww. DQs Bennett for the chair swing, but the ring announcer, because 
Nobody has communication with each other of what any of these finishes are. The ring announcer says it was from the Lariat. Just a horrible finish. This was atrocious. This was the worst thing on the show. But again, because they're, they're, they really have hit home what the heel-face dynamic is on this show, the crowd's all upset. Reggie Bennett uh, kind of got screwed, and she got, she got the raw end of the deal here. So yes, Denise Storm is off to the finals. God help us all. Now, the rumor that I was able to unconfirm was they wanted to have a weight limit with their title belts. And Reggie Bennett, because this was what Bockwinkle and uh, commentary was trying to kind of hint at uh, constantly throughout the night, was Bennett was too heavy. She didn't make the minimum weight limit for this title belt. Otherwise, they wanted to make a heavyweight title just for her and Eagle Sawai. That also kind of hints to why Sawai didn't win later. We'll get to that just here in a second. So yes, they rebooked a couple finishes because Bennett and Sawai were too heavy. They did not want to push them into their big title matches. So kind of some bullshit there, if it turn- if it was true. I'm leaning towards the yes part. Harley Saito defeats Eagle Sawai. This match went nine minutes, eight seconds, but they called it a 10 minute time limit draw. <laughs> uh, this was fine. It was it was definitely a more Western style, slower match over the faster pace you would see in Japan. I think they had to work this way because Saito's knee was was hurt and they worked until the 10 minute draw. Uh, didn't know it was even coming. The bell just randomly rings as they're in the middle of uh, various, uh, I think it was a submission hold. And the Commissioner Turtle Man goes to the ring. He goes ringside and he just goes, he points at Saito and goes, right there. She wins on points. <laughs> and Saito wins. Super confusing. Commentary didn't know what happened. I, I guess Saito won. <laughs> we're, we're just, it's ridiculous. We don't know what's happening. Why is there points in a wrestling match? Why did you, ha- why did you book a 10 minute draw? Why did it go nine minutes? Oh, there's, it's oh, ridiculous. What a mess. Tag title matches here. It is the Glamour Girls, Judy Barton and Lonnie Kai, your champions, taking on Bambi and Mal- Malaya Hosaka. Uh, Bambi is a southern southern woman, and uh, Hosaka is from Hawaii. Uh, and everyone thinks she is part of the Japanese contingent because of her Asian heritage. And so, of course, she gets booed. The Glamour Girls bit gets booed. Only Bambi is the face in this match, so comes and and Cornette is very adamant to point as why these Minnesota fans are being essentially racist. That's what he says. Uh, I love this match. It's basically the women independents at this point against here uh, against each other here. Glamour girls come to the ring in big fur coats. Cornette says ever everyone in the fans are gonna steal the, steal their coach because they're dirty thieves. Uh, cancel Cornette uh, continues on. And the Glamour Girls have their tiny little tag belts in hand that they make look like they're carrying pocket purses. So nice little, nice little uh, visual stick here going on with the Glamour Girls. I love me some Glamour Girls. And yes, the Glamour Girls look like uh, they're 20 years older. They're, they look like old leather. They're just so beat up and just it's a very common uh, joke with how the Glamour Girls are. Uh, time just doesn't look kind to them in any former appearance but damn it can they still wrestle super well the chemistry in this match was 1980s goodness it's good heat it's building up the hot tag and the gg here do the heel stick back in control uh they do the kind of bait and switch with a big power bomb spot uh very solid stuff glamour girls win boo good stuff oh excuse me and uh we're on to our tournament finals it's harley saito saito taking on denise storm various interviews uh, we're done prior. Eight minutes, seven seconds this went, and this was also pretty abysmal. I thought this was the worst match on the card because Storm is in control most of the match, and it's boring, and it's headlocks, and it's body holds. They're all on the mat. Saito tries to sell best for her, and funny enough, the crowd really gets behind Harley Saito. They they definitely uh, booked her quite well on the show with the big heel Eagle Sawai. Uh, Den- Denise Storm here, that was very much uh, uh, booked as a super heel of the show. So at least in the idea of, of booking, they knocked it out of the park here. I would not have had Denise Storm myself <laughs> going this far in the tournament. Uh, but anyways... Uh, 
Saito tries to sell her best, but come on. Saito wins off a European clutch, which seems to just blow everyone's mind yet again. So it's kind of funny here in 92 in retrospect. Uh, give me a second here. Uh, Saito wins uh, not a title. They don't present her with a title. She wins a cup as Commissioner Turtle Man brings the trophy in multiple pieces to the ring as we see him complete the puzzle like he's doing the Shrine of the Silver Monkey on Legends of the Hidden Temple. Saito grabs this completed trophy puzzle, and I wanted this thing to fall apart so bad in her hands. But alas, it remains in one piece. Okay. This interview, I must, I must play. I, I must recap for you guys. It's Terry Powers, our big baby face, challenging for uh, the title, the LPWA title. She's in the hospitality suite with Bonnie Blackstone, and there is no way I could do this justice. So here's a clip that I that I have made from this phenomenal backstage interview and promo from one Terry Powers. Here we go. In the hospitality suite with you once again, we have come down to the finale of this great Super Lady Showdown as Lady X is about to step in the ring against her greatest challenge ever. This lady to my left, Terry Power. Terry, you have been training hot and hard. How do you feel about going into this one? Mm, I feel stronger than ever. Uh... There's been a big difference in my training, and the training has been through my frame of mind and using the power of positive thinking. My training has had more passion in it now more than ever. Uh, I believe that this this match that I've been given is a gift, and I'm not going to waste it. Let's talk about the power of positive thinking. What's your last-minute comments? Mm, the power of positive thinking is with me, and I know anything that you can see up here, you'll attain it. I'll she's a visionary, it. and she's probably going to be the next LPWA Ladies Champion. Let's go now to Nick Mockwinkle and Sue Henning. <laughs> yes, the power of positive thinking will be with us all. <laughs> oh, man. It is like if you told me that Terry Powers went on an excursion to some some mountainside and she and she found some sort of spiritual guidance and she was smoking some I I, I, I don't I can't even believe it was weed. It had to be some sort of hashish. And she's just, ah, yes, the power of positive thinking. My frame of mind is behind. It's all with me. I see the clouds. Oh, God, it's it's great. The way she talks, her cadence. There, there's you you could tell me all kinds of things. I'd be I totally believe you. It's so funny the way she talks. I, I adore it so much. So, yes, we have our major title match here in the main event. It's Terry Powers gunning from for the evil Lady X. Big, uh, it very comes across as kind of a, an old assassin uh, type look. Uh, it's actually Peggy Lee Leather under the mask. Uh, yes, Peggy Lee was the early mid '80s WWF star. She teamed and rivaled with Wendy Richter and tagged with Velvet McIntyre. So uh, they got they got a, a big a big name under a mask. <laughs> I don't know why you would just you wouldn't just have her as Peggy Lee. But anyways, I'm I'm not the one booking here. Uh, Terry Powers is absolutely a power lifter and someone you could see straight out of American Gladiators, kind of dating myself, but I did love that show, and you could stick Terry Powers on American Gladiators with the joust, and she'd ki probably kick some ass. Uh, she is built like a brick shit house at this time, so there's your, there's your kind of visualizations there. Uh, so while the match was definitely on the rougher side, to say the least, it was acceptable for the skill level. I did not expect much going into this. Uh, nice heat segments from Lady X, good fire from Powers, and now we get to the end. Oh, this was a mess in execution. Lady X tries the whole loaded mask gimmick, like putting a stone in between on the forehead kind of situation, and she's going for a diving headbutt off the top rope. But Powers, instead of either rolling away from Lady X, or Lady X uh, jumping over Powers, uh, Lady X instead crashes directly into Powers while Powers tries to roll inside. A true blunder. So the headbutt absolutely just connects. So instead of panic or trying to call an audible to fix this blunder, they go about it. They just continue on like everything went fine. Uh, you know what have you I, maybe you should have called an audible but uh, anyways powers just simply gets up she goes to the top 
and hits a big cross body for the pin on Lady X. We got ourselves a new LPWA champion, and let's celebrate this amazing moment with the power of positive thinking. <laughs> oh, God. Terry, it wasn't long ago you and I were back in the hospitality suite. We were talking about the power of positive thinking and the importance of this matchup. You have done it, and now you're the new LPWA title holder. Your comments. Bonnie. This means so much. This belt is not just a belt of athletic competition. It's a belt that to me stands for a symbol of something that I've lived all my life, and that is the power of positive thinking. And what the power of positive thinking does is it enables your dreams to come through. And when you have dreams and you bust your booty, give it everything you've got and use the power of thinking, this is what happens. Dreams come true. And this isn't just for me. This is for your dreams out there, too. Did you get a little nervous when she went and grabbed the glass from Aldarusha? I, I had no idea. Uh, I don't think I've ever been hit so hard or been up against a tougher opponent. The only thing that helped Bonnie is the power of positive thinking and this wonderful audience and the people out there that have supported me for so long. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice little humble promo, but she stumbles over so many words there. It's really funny. Power of positive thinking, uh, power of thinking, thinking through. She has no idea what's going on. <laughs> She's all distressed. It's super, super hysterical. And that 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 closes out the show. Uh, they they go by all the all the people involved. It has credits. Uh, there's some blunders there in the credits as well. What a what a disaster. And the final. The final ridiculous blunder of this pay-per-view was, yes, they went over time and the television station that was playing the pay-per-view throughout the region cut the show off before the main event like true WCW fashion. So the people that paid for it didn't get to see the main event. What a disaster of a show. What a disaster of this thing put together. But for all of its nonsense and how terrible management and uh, the Jim Cornette's cancellation commentary was, uh, I rather enjoyed the show. I rather enjoyed the idea of what they wanted the sh wanted this kind of association to be. And what ends up happening is many months down the line, uh, LOPW launches their first show with or without this association, and they brand themselves as Ladies Legend pro wrestling LLPW and Kendori and company with her, with her roster of 14 uh, just go about their business. They do, they find their backing. They, they uh, really advertise uh, the hell out of, uh, out of the region. Um, everything was put together with kind of their own money, trying to back themselves into getting their own promotion started. Uh, they, they get a number of other people involved uh, to to help fund at least the start, and uh, it ends up being somewhat successful out of the gate with the fact that they were able to sell enough tickets and uh, turn a profit and start start to get paid. And from there, they were able to continue this uh, for a for a number of months. And we're gonna watch those shows. Uh, we're gonna cover them once a month. Uh, from here on, and I hope everyone signs up and follows me along on this journey. Uh, learning a lot of the wrestlers, learning the ways, learning the bookings, and who they are able to get. And the big thing that uh, they missed out on was Torberg was going to hire Norio Tateno, who had just uh, uh, recently retired in 91 uh, from AJW due to the mandatory retirement rule. And he was going to hire her straight up as a full-time wrestler representing uh, the LPWA and was going to be the big attraction, uh, big Japanese attraction for the promotion, and go back and forth between Japan and here. And uh, needless to say, uh, Tateno did not show up. She did not believe any of this bullshit <laughs> that, was, that was offered. And she, uh, she ends up joining LLPW with Kandori full-time, coming out of retirement as a full roster member. And we get to watch and cover the very first show, the launch show uh, for LLPW with Norio Tateno. And you know me, it's a big Tateno fan. I'm very excited uh, to start this journey 
Uh, join me next time at the Red Leaf Retrocast Patreon next month uh, for our very first true LLPW show. See you next time, everybody.